Euclid is one of the most respected figures of antiquity. He took the mathematical knowledge of his era, refined it, and reproduced all known geometrical facts through a logical system. That's why he's known as the father of geometry. His masterpiece, The Elements, shaped how geometry is done for more than two millennia. It presents geometric proofs using logic and a set of obvious geometrical or mathematical truths. The Elements is a collection of 13 books. They cover plain geometry, elementary number theory including Euclid's algorithm, and solid geometry. It's the most published textbook ever. Book 1 begins with definitions for geometric concepts, such as points, straight lines, angles, right angles, circles, and types of polygons. It then lays out Euclid's set of obvious truths, and then proceeds to prove numbered statements called propositions. For instance, the first book has 48 propositions, with the last two dealing with the Pythagorean theorem and its converse. Euclid's choice to accept postulate 12, known as the parallel postulate, is quite remarkable. Many of the best mathematicians over the centuries tried to invalidate his choice by coming up with a proof. However, they were all unsuccessful. It turns out that this postulate is the one of the choices that defines Euclidean geometry. When you adopt a different parallel axiom, you're no longer in Euclidean geometry. Instead, you enter the world of non-Euclidean geometry systems. It's a fascinating shift just from one postulate. The terms point and line are primitive concepts without strict definitions, allowing for variations between different types of geometry. Each geometry system has its own parallel axiom, leading to diverse outcomes. In some geometries, no two lines ever intersect. In others, lines can intersect multiple times. Take spherical geometry, for example. On the surface of a sphere, great circles play the role of straight lines of Euclidean geometry, and they always intersect twice. In this setting, triangles can have internal angles that add up to more than 180 degrees. These facts might seem strange from a Euclidean perspective, but they are entirely logical and can be proven, not to mention that they are indispensable to some fields such as cartography and astronomy. Proposition 1 is one of many examples demonstrating where some of Euclid's proofs fell short. We're given a line segment and need to figure out how to draw the other sides to build an equilateral triangle. Euclid's proof for Proposition 1 is beautiful, but when you look at it with modern standards, there are gaps in his reasoning. Let's review his proof first. Euclid begins his proof by drawing two circles, one at each end of the given line segment, each with a radius equal to the segment's length. Euclid's postulate 3 allows him to draw circles with any center and radius. Next, Euclid argues that the circles intersect at a point C. This is crucial because it helps form the triangle's vertex. His next step is to connect points A and B with C to form a triangle. According to postulate 1, any two points can be connected by a straight line, so this is perfectly acceptable. Notice that AB is a radius to both circles, and both AC and BC are radii of their respective circles. Given that all radii of a circle are of equal length, it follows that the length of AC is equal to the length of AB, and likewise, the length of BC is equal to the length of AB. The length of AC and the length of BC, by axiom 1, are also equal to one another. So, all three sides are equal to each other, which makes triangle ABC an equilateral triangle. Everything seems to be in order, but appearances can be deceiving. Let's take a closer look to find out what's really missing from Euclid's proof. If you were careful enough, you would have noticed that Euclid's proof hinged on the observation that the two circles intersect. And of course, they do intersect in the diagram. But how do we know this? With postulate 3, we can draw circles, but it doesn't actually say anything about how the drawn circles relate to each other. So, when we say that the two circles intersect, that's just an assumption. There's no mathematical justification at all. This is where Euclid's proof fails. Let's discuss another proof to understand how much chaos a diagrammatic assumption can create. Consider triangle ABC and draw one of the angular bisectors and the perpendicular bisector across. Let them meet at a point I. 
Drawing the perpendiculars onto the two sides of the triangle ABC forms two pairs of right triangles. Using similarity theorems for right triangles, the same colored right triangles turn out to be congruent to each other. This means that the lateral sides of the triangle ABC are equal to each other. Because we have not made any assumptions about the triangle ABC, we just proved that all triangles are isosceles. You can double check to find out that there is no reasoning error in this proof. The error was made at the beginning. The diagram was wrong. The angular bisector and perpendicular bisector meet outside the triangle. This alters one of the side length computations from an addition to a subtraction and restores the diversity of triangles as expected. The moral of the story is that diagrams may be misleading. So, assuming the intersection point based on the diagram is a major error that invalidates any proof including the Euclid's proof of the proposition one. You may be thinking that while diagrams can sometimes mislead us, in Euclid's proof of proposition one, everything is so simple and obvious that this would not happen. After all, circles passing through each other's center should intersect once above and once below right? Well, not always. The answer depends on the fundamental properties of the geometric system. One can come up with interesting definitions of planes where Euclid's definitions remain meaningful and his postulates and axioms hold true, but circles passing through each other's center don't intersect. A simple example is the following. Consider a flat Cartesian plane where points on the plane are restricted to those with rational number coordinates. On this plane, we can still draw lines and circles, and all of Euclid's postulates still hold true. However, there's a catch. The coordinates of the intersection points of the two circles in Proposition 1 are not rational. This means those intersection points cannot belong to the circles. Thus, the circles do not intersect at all. This example clearly illustrates once again that even simple diagrams cannot be trusted. We must either prove that the two circles intersect or add another postulate about it to have a valid proof. Unfortunately, Euclid fails to do this. The mistakes in the elements are not limited to the proposition one. Another faulty one is the proof of proposition four. In this proposition, Euclid presents strong reasoning for the side-angle-side congruency of two triangles. At the beginning of the proof, he intuitively moves one triangle to cover the other for comparison. However, there's no prior postulate or theorem that allows for this operation. To fix this, we need to add new postulates about angle or triangle congruency. Similar axiomatic gaps can be found elsewhere in the elements, and they too require additional postulates to be resolved. The principles of the elements were revised by mathematicians starting in the late 19th century to fill the missing gaps in Euclid's proofs, the first complete set providing a gapless basis to prove all the propositions in the elements was laid out by David Hilbert at the turn of the 20th century. Later, with the establishment of real numbers, George Burkhoff published a shorter set of axioms. The geometry taught in secondary schools today is largely derived from Burkhoff's postulates. So, there you have it. Euclid had mistakes, and he narrowly missed his ideal of full logical derivation of all the propositions, but his elements was a pivotal advancement in the right direction. We must not forget that for more than two millennia, Euclid's geometry was utilized successfully across civilizations. Eventually, critical studies of the elements led other mathematicians to accomplish what he had aimed for. We now have several different sets of axioms that produce gapless logical proofs of all the propositions in the elements. Thanks for joining me. Stay curious and keep exploring.